All right, there's other things we might talk about. For example, we haven't talked about the time constant, but we uh, have limited time. The time constant, though, just for the, the record, is r times c. If you had to calculate the time constant, this is r times c. Uh, actually, I, I guess we, we should say one little bit about this. What does the, uh, the symbol for the time constant is tau. The time constant tells us how long it's going to take to get, to get two-thirds of the way to our asymptotic limit. The time constant tells us how long it's going to take to get two-thirds of the way to our asymptotic limit. Roughly speaking, the time constant tells us how long it takes to get about two-thirds of the way to our asymptotic limit. So for example, this would be about two-thirds of the way to our limit here. So this would be tau. Or in this case, in this case, we're moving downwards. So in this case, this represents 2 thirds of the way towards our limit. Since we're starting from here, 2 thirds of the way would be 2 thirds from the top. So this would be tau. This was supposed to be the same circuit with the same resistor and capacitor. So if I had drawn these correctly, these should have been the same horizontal distance. They should have been the same time constant. They didn't come out right because I wasn't thinking about that. But anyway, tau tells you how long it takes to get two-thirds of the way to your asymptotic limit. That either means two-thirds of the way up from zero or two-thirds of the way down from your maximum. Why can't we just say how long it takes to get to the limit? Well, because technically we never get to the limit. Technically, we never get to the limit, so the best we can say is how long it takes to say get two-thirds of the way. This is like when we were working with half-lives last week. The half-life tells you how long it takes to get to remove half of the substance. Why can't we just say how long it takes to remove all of it? Because technically, you never remove all of it. You just go to zero asymptotically. So by calculating RC, that will give you a sense of how long it takes to get to two-thirds of where you're going. And remember that typically, this could be very small, so we can deliver the energy very quickly. All right, now we have to see how an inductor would work. talked about inductors, but these are an important type of circuit elements. The symbol for an inductor is a coil, because inductors are coils. The symbol for a capacitor is two parallel plates, because the most common type of a capacitor, at least in problems, is a parallel plate capacitor. I don't know why we use a jacket line for resistance. Now, inductors are related to the idea of electromagnetic induction. Let's say that we have a changing current going through the inductor. Well, we know that currents induce, mag uh, I'm sorry, we know that currents generate magnetic fields. Remember, this is our equation for the magnetic field generated by a long straight wire. So we know that currents do generate magnetic fields. That was one of the key ideas from earlier on. Therefore, a changing current would give you a changing magnetic field. You can see that from this equation for the long straight wire, changing I would change B. But a changing magnetic field means a changing magnetic flux. We learned about magnetic flux a little bit when we were working with induction. This was the formula for magnetic flux. The key point is the magnetic flux depends on the magnetic field. If you change the flux, you change the field. The key point here is that the current through these loops is going to generate a magnetic field through the loops. 
But if we change the current, we're going to change the magnetic field inside of the loops, so there's going to be a changing magnetic flux inside of the loops. Well, remember, that causes an induced voltage. That's why this is called electromagnetic induction. The changing magnetic flux induces a voltage. Oftentimes, we use V for voltage, but in this context, we often use a capital epsilon for the induced voltage. This could also be called the induced EMF. And this would be then an induced voltage drop across the inductor. And I don't know how much time you had to learn Lenz's law when we were looking at induction. Lenz's law says that the induced voltage opposes the change that was causing it. This over here is trying to oppose this change. This is trying to oppose this change over here. For example, if this current The key idea is that this is going to act to oppose this change. Lenz's law says that induction acts, is to, acts to oppose the change. The upshot of this then is that an inductor prevents a jump in current. An inductor prevents a jump in current. the current from changing at all, but it can keep it from jumping. How does that compare to a capacitor? What does a capacitor prevent jumps in? <coughs> the voltage. That's right. So that's the key difference between an inductor and a capacitor. A inductor prevents a jump in current, and a capacitor prevents a jump in voltage, also charge. How does the capacitor prevent the jump in voltage? Well, it takes time for the charges to accumulate that would allow the voltage to accumulate, so it can only change continuously. How does the inductor prevent the jump in current? Well, we can see that right here. A changing current is opposed by the induced voltage, and this can't prevent the current from changing at all, but it can prevent it from jumping. So this is going to prevent the current from jumping. It will force it to change continuously. The symbol for inductors is L. I'm not sure why they used L for an inductor, but they can't use I because that's the symbol for current. So we're going to use L for inductors. This tells us how big the induced voltage is over here. L is the inductance of the inductor. It's just a physical characteristic of the inductor. Remember how the resistance was a physical characteristic of the resistor and the capacitance was a physical characteristic of the capacitor. Well, L is analogous to those. It's a physical characteristic of the inductor and its unit is the Henry. We always want to try to learn each unit. So the unit for an inductor, for inductance, is the Henry. Well, this just summarizes what we saw here. We saw the voltage is caused by the changing current. So the more the current is changing, the more this is going to struggle against that. We well, can see that here. If the current is changing a lot, this would be a big derivative, and there would be a big induced voltage. What about if the current isn't changing at all? Well, if the current isn't changing at all, this derivative is zero, and then there is no induced voltage. So this shows that the voltage only exists to prevent the change in the current. This equation shows that this voltage only exists to prevent the change in the current. If there weren't any change in the current, there would be no induced voltage in the inductor.
its sole purpose in life is to, is to oppose that change in the current. This negative sign is just to show that this is trying to cancel out this change. Whatever the current is doing, the, this induced voltage is trying to cancel it out. That's the only significance of the negative sign here. Now we can see again why the current can't jump. Because if the current jumped, that would be an infinite derivative. A jump would be an infinite derivative, which would mean an infinite voltage, which doesn't make sense. You can't have an infinite voltage. So this is another way to show that even though the inductor can't prevent the current from changing at all, it has to change smoothly so that it has a derivative that exists.